Okay, good morning. Let's take a look at this first question here and try to see a couple of different ways to think through solving a problem of this variety. So we're told we have 12 grams of hydrogen that reacts with an unknown amount of oxygen and 76.0 grams of water forms by the reaction. So how much H2 remains? You know, so we have this question of did all of that H2 actually react or did just some portion of it react upon the formation of 76.0 grams of water? So we know for every two moles of water that are formed, two moles of hydrogen gas had to have reacted. So we could approach this problem and just set up a dimensional analysis problem where we could solve for the number of grams of H2 that must have reacted if we formed 76.0 grams of water. So we'll use the molar mass of water, 18.02 grams per mole of water. For every two moles of water that formed, we had to have originally had two moles of H2 react to form that water. So if we form two moles of H2, and I'm just picking that up from the coefficients in the reaction. So there's a two in front of water, two in front of H2. And then the molar mass of H2, one mole of H2 has a mass of 2.016 grams. So we could work that out. Now, one of the keys here is just kind of trying to think of, okay, we're forming 76 grams of water, converting that to moles. Means that 8.50 grams of hydrogen had to have reacted to produce that quantity. So when I get this number here, one of the problems with stoichiometry problems is you get a lot of numbers. You have to remember what the numbers mean. So you just have to kind of come back to the sequence of the problem. If we're producing 76 grams of water, we had to have began and had reacted 8.50 grams of H2 with it. And so then the difference between that and the 12 is what must remain. You know, so if we lost 8.5 grams of hydrogen, we started with 12, that difference is what remains. So we can take our initial, we had 12.0 grams of H2 here, and minus the 8.50 grams of H2 that reacted. So that gives me 3.50, I guess I get points deducted for sig figs. It should just be 3.5 grams if we're following sig fig rules. Um, so I'll give myself a one point deduction on that. But so this should really be 3.5 grams of H2. And so that's going to look like the 3.49 grams in the answer. Now, so three and a half grams of hydrogen remains following the reaction because eight and a half grams of it had reacted to produce the indicated quantity of water. Now, an alternate approach, it's a different way of thinking through the problem is with this BCA chart, like a before change after. You don't necessarily need to apply both, but some of you may be thinking, okay, I'm lost on the dimensional analysis problem. There's another way of thinking of this problem. There is. We know, according to the stoichiometry, that we're gaining 2x for every x of oxygen we lose and every 2x of hydrogen we lose. And I'm just putting the coefficient in front of the x based on the coefficient for that reactant in the reaction. And so that means after the reaction, we're going to have 12.0 minus 2x. We're going to have whatever we started with minus x left over for the oxygen. And then we will have 2x form in the case of water. So you could look here. And generally, you're thinking moles here or molecules because those are the reacting units. Like x is in units of moles. We're losing two moles of H2 for every one mole of O2 for every two moles of water that we gain. And so when we're, we're looking at x here, we might solve for x in terms of the number of moles of water. So we might set 2x equal to the number of moles of water in that 76.0 grams. Solve for x, and then we can plug x in accordingly for hydrogen to figure out how much of the hydrogen remains. Honestly, I think that's a little trickier, you know, because that way we have to kind of remember, well, how are we picking x? Well, the x's here are just the reacting coefficients according to the reaction. 
And then the after, this is what's present after the reaction. The B is what's present before the reaction. Reaction, we had hydrogen and oxygen, no water yet before the reaction. That's why we had some hydrogen, some oxygen, but none of the water yet formed. And then we allow the reaction to take place to produce the 76 grams. So I like the dimensional analysis approach because we have to think our way through the problem. We could set up a chart to help us understand what's being gained, what's being lost, and the right ratios of gaining and losing according to the coefficients of the reaction. And the coefficients of the reaction are like locked in. Like we're not changing the coefficients. 2H2 plus 1O2 goes to 2 water. Those are just the coefficients that tell us what the reacting orders are for the reactants in the problem. OK, and so then the last thing we might do is just solve for what X is in terms of oxygen, or how many grams of O2 must have reacted. And so we can go back. Like, I might do this problem this way by solving for the number of grams of O2. Back with dimensional analysis, we had 76 grams of water that formed. Same conversion, 18.02 grams per mole of water. Then one mole of water, or um, two moles of water form for every one mole of O2 that had reacted. And then one mole of oxygen is 32 grams, 32.00 grams. And then we can work that out and see that that's going to come out to the 67.5 grams of oxygen. Now again, we could solve for x with the moles of water, and x would be equal to moles of oxygen. And then we can convert that to grams using the molar mass if we go with like the chart approach. So the chart, I think it should make sense on what it means and how we use it. I think the metro analysis should make sense in how we use it. Just either one is maybe applied to a particular problem or whichever one seems easier to crunch the numbers for a given problem. But the key is that your chart's going in moles. Like if you're writing a BCA chart, either solve for the quantities in moles or convert them to moles or just know that your x's should be moles and then you can uh, convert those to grams using a molar mass afterwards. Now, one last thing to point out, mole of O2 to grams of O2. Like, whenever you're looking at a conversion, how do you know to use the mass of oxygen versus O2? And it's just clearly determined based on whatever the thing is. So a mole of O2, you calculate the grams of the two oxygens. And some other problems, like we did combustion problems, we had CH and O atoms. So there you were just using the uh, molar masses of carbon alone, oxygen just one atom, H one atom. So you just look at whatever you're figuring out the molar mass of, if it's O2, two oxygens. And if it's just a single O, then you just use the mass of one O. OK, so mostly just some reminders on those problems. OK, a couple updates. Um, these are mostly the same as last time, but midterm Tuesday or next lecture here in class, we'll get a seating chart posted. As soon as I have one available, I'll post it on Carmen, shoot an announcement. So you have an idea. It'll be like one particular lab section will sit here. Some might sit in the balcony. But you'll have part of the room that you can head towards very first part of the lecture on Tuesday so we can get everybody seated quickly. Your lab TA, uh, we may have some subs because some of them have classes during the day. So either your lab TA or their substitute TA will pass your exam out, collect your IDs, things of that nature. So make sure to bring a, your buck ID to the test. Uh, make sure to, um, it's a good idea to know your student ID number. It's on your ID card as well. But if you happen to know your ID number, that's helpful. Um, but it's on your buck ID. So bring your buck IDs. I'll write that. I should have included that on the, on the things. Calculator, make sure you get the right calculator. Periodic tables provided. And I still don't know what I was meaning on that thing there. But um, just a few equations are provided. Non-SI conversions will be provided if you need them, like gallons to liters and grams to, to pounds and things like that. So you don't have to memorize conversion factors other than the pico, the nano, the micro, the prefixes to convert using prefixes within the SI system. OK. I usually do questions. I'll take two questions if there's any questions lingering this morning. Anything? I can also take zero questions. That's good. OK. We'll move. Look at this question here. Um, I'll set it up, and then some of you guys may not have had enough time to answer it, so I'll give you guys a few more minutes to work on this one. But we have sodium and chlorine gas reacting to form NaCl. So we've got to write that reaction and balance it as the first part. And then we're trying to determine the mass of product that forms when 23 grams of sodium and 70.9 grams of chlorine react together. Now, this is a very common type example where you're not told 
to consider which is the limiting reactant. But you have to consider which reactant is limiting in almost every type of problem where you're given just some random masses. So we're going to have to figure out which reactant's limiting, which one's excess. Um, you may have thought the easy way to do the problem would be just to add the two masses together, since you're taking two elements and forming one product, can we just add the two masses together? That only works if they happen to be the right stoichiometric quantities of those two reactants. So make sure to consider if you have a limiting reactant versus an excess reactant problem to determine which one's limiting, and then figure out how much sodium chloride forms. All right, I'll give you guys about two or three minutes to finish this one up. So we'll say about two minutes. Okay, let's take a look at this one here. So we have sodium chlorine. I wrote the reaction balance it out. So two sodiums and a chlorine combining to form two NaCl's. Now, I think there's three main ways to solve a problem like this. And I'm going to briefly go through the three, just because, again, if we understand one, we should understand them all. And if we don't understand one of them, we probably don't really understand any of them either. You know? So we have to really just make sure we understand what we're trying to accomplish in a problem like this. If I'm going to uh, use a BCA chart for my first one, what I probably want to do is convert the moles, or just like, think about the moles for our reactants. So sodium is 22.99 grams per mole. That's 1.00 mole of sodium. And likewise, the molar mass of Cl2 is 70.90 grams per mole. So that works out to 1.00 mole of Cl2. So what I'm really trying to figure out, I know this is going to lose 2x and this is going to lose x. So for every two sodiums we lose, we have to lose one chlorine. OK, so if I lose the whole one mole of sodium, how many moles of chlorine need to go with it? That would be half. So it would be for every two moles of sodium, one mole of chlorine goes with it. Likewise, if I were to consume all of the chlorine, I'd lose one mole of chlorine. For every one mole of chlorine, I need two moles of sodium. So if I'm going to lose, if, if x is going to be equal to one mole, like if we're going to lose the whole mole of chlorine, send it to zero, then I'm going to have to lose twice that quantity in terms of the moles of sodium. I don't have two moles of sodium to lose. So we can't lose and send chlorine all the way to zero. So instead, what we have to do is completely consume the sodium. Send it to zero. Have it be the limiting reactant. So then x is equal to half a mole. And then we lose half a mole of chlorine. Then, of course, we're going to gain a mole. So we're going to gain 2x. So that's going to be equal to 1.0 mole of the product. And then we can look up the molar mass of the product. It's like 58.5 grams per mole. We get a mole of it. So that leads to the answer. Now, in a lot of ways, like this is fine, but it, th there's a lot of thinking involved here. You know, like there's a lot of thought that has to go into, okay, I have to convert the moles, I have to write some numbers down, I have to then think I really need grams here, so I have to convert the mole afterwards um, to, uh, to grams using a molar mass. It works out pretty nice here because it's like even numbers. It works pretty easy in this problem because we get one mole. It's pretty easy to see which reactants is, uh, is limiting in excess, and even I can do one mole times a molar mass pretty easily. So it's really easy to do the numbers this way. Other problems, or another approach, is to just like maybe try to make the product off each of the reactants. Like that's probably method number two. Method number two, and probably the fastest way to actually solve this particular problem, would be just to try to figure out the number of grams of NaCl that you can produce using both of the reactants. So go through this reaction two times, taking all of the sodium. to product, and then imagining if we had reacted all of the chlorine to product. And so then we just do this conversion, convert to moles of sodium, so that's 22.99 grams per mole of sodium. Two moles of sodium produce, if they fully react, two moles of NaCl, one mole of NaCl. 
is 22, or not 22, it's 58.5 grams. And then chlorine, very similar. It's molar mass, 70.9 grams per mole of Cl2. One mole of Cl2, when it reacts, produces two moles of sodium chloride, and then one mole of sodium chloride, same molar mass. So if we hadn't written out the BCA chart, this is the only work we had written out. We only have two calculations we need to do, and we're going to get two numbers here. Um, they could be the same. What would it mean if I get the same mass of sodium chloride with both reactants in a given problem? That would mean we have the exact stoichiometric quantities of the two reactants, and neither one is in excess. If we get one is a greater quantity and the other is a lesser quantity, if we run the numbers real quick, so that's 70.9 divided by the same number, so that's one mole times two. I'm doing the lower one first. I'm doing the chlorine calculation first. That gives me 117 <coughs> grams of product if all of the chlorine is consumed, so consume all the chlorine, we get 117 grams of NaCl. If we consume all the sodium, that works out to 58.5 grams. Just from doing 23 divided by 23 times 2 divided by 2 times 58.5. So if I consume all the sodium and we're out of sodium, we hit 58.5 grams of product. If we were to consume all this, the chlorine, we would get more, but what's the problem? Of course, the problem is I've ran out of sodium, so I can't get 117. As soon as I get to 58.5, I've hit the limit on how much sodium is present and can't make any more product beyond 58.5. Now, I imagine most of you understand that, and it's mostly preaching to the choir at this point, but I just want to make sure to kind of show the comparison of using a chart versus solving the problem a second way, that it's the same solution. You get the same answer, and the thought process is similar, and, and works together to lead to the answer. Okay, now the third approach, which I'm not gonna work through the math on it, would be just take one of the reactants and see how much mass of the other reactant you need to react with it, and then from there try to figure out which of the two reactants must be the limiting reactant based on that problem. Now, that particular problem is really helpful if the problem said, well, how much of the excess reactant remains? So these uh, stoichiometry problems usually ask you to do something, like how much product you produce. And that might lead us towards this problem here more often than not, or as the fastest way to solve that problem. We may be asked how much of an excess reactant remains, in which case we may say, well, let me take the sodium and see how much chlorine I need to react fully with it according to the reaction. And then figure out how much chlorine is needed to react and then take the difference for how much of the excess remains. So we can tailor which of the problem solutions we go through to most, most quickly give us the answer if we're being really savvy on a midterm, we might take that approach. So three main approaches, I think, are set up a chart. Second approach, calculate products based off your two reactants, see which one makes less. That's coming from your limiting reactant. And then the third approach would be take one reactant and see how much of the other reactant you need to react with it. I saw a hand lingering over here. Yeah. So in theory, so like, would you have to fill in the blanks into a BCA chart? I think there's a lab question that maybe you're referring to. I mean, I would say it's possible that that could be a question on the test. Um, you know, but, but it's among a lot of other possibilities for questions that could be on the test. Um, I, I think of this more as the ability to just think through the problem. So I'm not necessarily showing you the BCA chart to be able to fill one in per se, but just to understand what it means and how it might be tailored to solve a particular problem. Okay, any, uh, so those are, there's a couple of final stoichiometry questions. I don't know if we'll see too much more on stoichiometry in this particular lecture. That's just that second problem again, so that was, this is nothing we need. Okay. So let's start talking exam review. So the rest of class is going to be used to do a few things. It's going to talk, we're going to talk a little bit about study habits and how you guys might prepare for our midterm next week. So let's talk a little bit about that. We'll go through a little bit of just study habit suggestions for things to think about moving forward in, in the class. And then lastly, we'll try to get into reviewing some of those problems from the exam packet that I posted. 
Um, and if I don't get to all those problems, I'm not sure if you guys saw my announcement yesterday, but if I don't get to a solution today of all the problems on that packet I posted yesterday, I'll record you know, a screencast of those after class, get those posted to YouTube probably by tomorrow afternoon. I'm also um, taking a call for other problems. We have seven practice exams that are posted on Carmen. You may or may not have started looking at some of these. It's okay if you haven't. I think it's good that, that if you're trying to do your learning, get chapter three finished and then start reviewing over the weekend. But as you have questions on that midterm, um, start sending them to me and I'll make videos posting solutions to some of those practice exam problems that are posted on Carmen. I think I said I do up to 20. But if I get a lot of emails, I'll, I'll post more, because it's really easy for me just to record a quick solution to a problem, put it up on YouTube for the whole class to see. OK, so some exam review ideas. I think uh, by now, most of you guys should have done a lot of things like previewing chapters, watching maybe uh, pre-lecture videos, coming to class, doing problem sets. So I mean, you should have seen a variety of different types of questions. And probably the number one way to prepare for the midterm is like how you approach those assignments. You know, so thinking about like midterm two, your best preparation for midterm two is probably how you're like reviewing chapter four the day before we covered in class, you know, or the day after we covered in class. So like most of your real gains in the midterm, I think, are gonna come from those choices you're making on how and when maybe you're doing some supplemental reading, how and when you're um, watching some extra videos, and just how you're taking information in in class, and just generally like trying to be a leader here at trying to be the one to teach your neighbors um, when needed how to do a problem, or just generally trying to have that idea, like getting good at doing problems the first time you see them is really like probably the goal of your homework, or at least getting into the problem sets. Like problem sets are a little harder. Um, if we're needing to go back to the book to do those problems, that's kind of scary, because it probably means come the exam time, you might still need that book. So at some point, we gotta like disconnect from notes and videos and the internet and extra help and be able to solve the problems by ourselves. So I think going towards midterm one on Tuesday, it's like doing a lot of studying this weekend without the book and trying to force yourself to use what you know and not use any extra crutches. Now, it's really easy to do those things and it's not necessarily wrong some of the time to go back in your book and look something up. Like when you're doing a pre-lecture assignment, that's kind of the idea is for you to be reviewing the text applying it to some simpler problems so you can learn the content and start solving problems with it. As you progress, as you get to a problem set, try to start closing your textbooks so that you're forcing yourself to use your knowledge that you learn. And then even when you start doing practice exams, it's like trying to take that like a real test and take one of the tests and then grade yourself afterwards and then go review before you try another exam. Um, a lot of times you may think a particular practice test, as long as you can figure out how to do the problems, you're good. That's not quite good enough, I don't think. I think the idea of a practice test is if you can do the problems closed book and um, an exam-like setting and get a good score, then I think you're ready for the real test. If not, like I said, try to figure out what types of problems you're missing, review that content, take another practice test. Um, there's some nuances uh, to those practice exams. There, um, you know, I mentioned this a little bit, how last fall was the first time we did what we call like a uh, a combined midterm where we wrote a common exam for all of the Chem 1210 classes. So the autumn 17 and the spring 18 tests are the exact exams we used last autumn in Chem 1210 and last spring in Chem 1210. The previous year, uh, we all just wrote our own midterm. So each of the different instructors at 1210 would just write their own midterm. So you see five old midterms. I can tell you mine has a few nuanced questions of things we're not exactly covering in the same way. And some of my colleagues' exams kind of have a question or two. And it's kind of, it, it's hard to, to both give you some extra questions to study from, but then also say a few of the problems may appear strange. You know, so just know that each of the extra five exams um, that have like a little code for somebody's name, that, that those might have a few nuanced questions within them. Okay, so what should we do to start preparing for the exam? First thing I'd say is reading the chapter summary. If you go to, um, well, let me ask a gen generic question real quick. How many of you guys are reading the e-text like regularly? And it's okay if you don't. Um, okay, so I don't see a whole lot of hands. I see maybe a third of the class. That's fine. Do you guys know how to get to the e-text? Um, like you get to the e-text by going to Carmen, like going into mastering, and on the, sa on the tab, there's an the e-text. If you go into the e-text, go to like chapter one or chapter two or chapter three. You don't have to do it right now. But, uh, but if you go to each of the chapters, there's a summary. If you have a hard print text, if you have a regular textbook, there's a summary at the end of each chapter as well. But go, I would read the summary, because it's like a page long. 
And you'll probably know right away if you need a more detailed go read through something. So the summary should really just be things you already know, just refreshing things in your mind. And then the other thing I would do is then spend some time reviewing the learning outcomes. So the next page after the chapter summary are a whole list of learning outcomes. I actually have them um, on the next slide. So we'll take a look at some of those for the first few chapters. And so I would spend about 30 to 45 minutes just like reading through learning outcomes. If you use the e-text, there's a really cool thing where you can link to a homework problem. So each of the learning outcomes, let me show one of these. So if you have the e-text, these links don't work. This is just a PDF screen capture. But if you're using the e-text, you could click and link to different parts of the book or different homework problems to give you a sample problem of these learning outcomes. So for chapter one, we should be able to distinguish like elements, compounds, and mixtures. The idea being, can we identify something as a hom um, um, homogeneous mixture, single phase, or multi-phase for like a heterogeneous mixture, separate from compounds or elements? Can we identify symbols of common elements? I think we said the first four rows plus the, the more common larger elements like silver and gold and, and lead, things like that. So just identifying symbol versus name, name versus symbol. You don't have to memorize where things are in a periodic table. Obviously, you get the chart for the test, but it's just simple like you don't want to mistake potassium for P or something strange like that on the test. Potassium, of course, is K. So just knowing the name versus symbol, symbol versus name helps us grab the right atomic weight when we need them. Distinguish kinetic and potential energy. Kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared. Potential energy just relates either to like the physics idea of a bicyclist at the top of a hill, has high potential energy, can lose that by transferring that, kinetic, uh, that potential energy into motion as you go down the, the mountain and then have a lower potential energy once you get to the bottom. Chemical reactions, very similar. You can think of water uh, forming from H2NO2. It's like the H2NO2 at the top of a hill. They, uh, a big violent reaction occurs, a lot of heat's given off, that's the energy given off as we go down the, the slope to form the more stable water. And we're just like inferring that off the observation, we blew that balloon up of H2NO2 to make water so that we could see that from that reaction and all that heat given off that we had to have formed the more stable water at the bottom of the valley. That was another concept of like electrostatic potential energy for, the, um, for ions. So ions have an attraction, like a plus and a minus, and the, the more highly charged those ions are, the stronger the attraction. So you could think of like two plus cations and a two minus anion are going to have a stronger attraction compared to say a plus one and a minus one. Or if you put them closer together, that's better than further away. But um, likewise, paired charges, plus and plus would repel. So um, two cations repel each other, two anions would repel each other, but plus and minus are attracted together. And so we're just picking that up from um, either uh, lecture examples from uh, a problem you could link to, reviewing the text on some of these. What else do we have? Um, calculate the kinetic energy of an object. That's 1 half mv squared. That's one of the equations you get on the test. And then the conversion in the joules, that's another conversion that you would get for 1 joule is 1 kilogram meter squared per second squared. So we just have to make sure we put things in the right units to solve for these quantities in the proper units. Identify common metric prefixes. Talked about that a lot. Um, demonstrate the use of sig figs, scientific notation, SI units. So we did that in a lot of examples. We might see a review problem here today. Um, use appropriate SI units for defined quantities. So chapter one, I think very um, kind of obvious the type of questions I think we should expect to see based on these learning outcomes. When we write, kind of look at these outcomes and try to think of questions that almost hammer on one or two of these objectives within a particular question. So um, chapter two, where um, some of these objectives are um, list the basic postulates of Dalton's atomic theory. The, the Dalton's atomic theory is just the idea of atoms. You know, so the idea of atoms, uh, each element has uh, something that makes it different. So the atoms of one element are different than the atoms of a different element. But the atoms of a particular element, according to Dalton, were supposed to be the same. Now, we do see that they're similar, not exactly the same. Some elements have isotopes that we now know. So some elements may vary in their, their neutron counts then ends up being the neutral particle. It doesn't really change the property of the atom by very much. The key experiments in the discovery of atomic theory. So you might think about, OK, J.J. Thompson, like think about the name, uh, think about the experiment, cathode ray tube experiment, um, high voltage source on a gas um, to try to generate a particle. And the particle's charge was determined because it was bent with a magnetic and electric field. So that just meant, hey, we're making a negatively charged particle. And that was found to be subatomic through Millikan's oil drop experiment. 
there's a lot of strange questions on Milliken on some people's old tests. Um, even last year's test had a couple weird questions. And, and this is another topic I would say. Whenever you see a question, like how many of you guys came across the Milliken question? It's in, one of them's in here. There's a few weird questions. So just, you gotta keep a few things in mind. If we pick something to go a little bit more in depth on on a midterm, usually we don't pick that same topic the next year. You know, so if you see something that kind of comes out of left field, there will be one or two questions on our midterm that probably you look back on and feel the same way about, and there'll probably be something different than on the old midterms. Um, so, you know, but it's not gonna be 30 questions worth that come out of left field. And so there'll, there'll just be a couple of questions we try to see who's really thinking through a particular topic on a, on a you know, really deep level. But again, one or two questions kind of go in that, that route. So um, Milliken's oil drop experiment, the idea you had oil droplets that with an X-ray uh, source, we were, uh, the scientists were creating electrons on those droplets, and the way they determined that they were in fact doing that was by seeing that each of the droplets had a multiple of charge that ended up being the multiple charge of one electron, of the 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Now the main idea here is that you could create like one electron on a droplet, two electrons on some of the other droplets, some droplets had three or four or five electrons, and that charge was like being levitated using an electric field. So you had a negative particle on a mass. So you had like a, a droplet that has a mass with a charge, and you put a negative plate below it to repel that charge upward. And just use like a, an X-ray to kind of see where that droplet is to figure out where's the right balance of electrical charge versus the mass of that actual peak to work out the charge. That's a very tough physics problem. To me, like it's very challenging to think about what, what that means physically. Like how do you calculate the charge? How does it relate to the mass of the of the droplet, but the, the idea is they just saw um, a, a, um, each droplet had a different charge, and then they just worked out the simplest charge. They just worked out the least amount of charge you could have on a droplet that was from one electron being added onto the droplet, hence the mass of one elect or the, um, the charge of one electron. So Millikan's experiment determined the mass and the charge of the electron, definitely determined it to be a subatomic particle. Um, the discovery of the electron would be from the previous experiment, from the cathode ray tube experiment, discovered the electron, and then its properties, its mass were determined in that second one. Um, some of the other key experiments, uh, the radioactivity experiments found the positive particle um, to, to pair up with the negative particle. It turned out to be a helium nuclei. Very interestingly, they didn't even know at the time it was the helium nuclei. So the alpha particle was found to be the positive particle. It ends up containing um, two protons and two neutrons. That's the exact number that make it the helium-4 nuclei, a really stable nuclei, which was being given off by radioactive material. And so from, uh, um, from, from the radioactivity experiments, you kind of got the negative subatomic particle and then the collection of two of those uh, protons, a positively charged particle. And they were much more massive. So the electron was very light. The protons were very heavy. And they saw that from the electron being bent a lot by that electric field, and then the positive particle just a tiny bit. Um, so the mass, to, the mass ratio, or the mass of that particle was much heavier in the radioactivity experiments. And so then the final like, key experiment, I think, was the, uh, the gold foil experiment. Very thin sheet of gold, shoot those helium nuclei, that we now know helium nuclei, but shoot that big particle at a thin strip of gold, basically like a tissue paper of metal atoms, and the idea should have been that they should have went right through because they were thinking that all these particles, they weren't even quite sure what protons were yet or what neutrons even were. Neutrons weren't discovered until 20 years after this experiment at, in the first place. So they didn't even quite know exactly what the atom was at all. They just figured it would just be a bunch of randomly interdispersed particles so that if you shot another particle, they would all just go straight through because you'd have a pretty big particle, really small particles, but they'd all go straight through. And what they saw was scattering. And so they saw, and even backscattering. And so that led to the idea of those particles accumulating into a big nuclei, or relatively big nuclei, uh, compared to maybe the size you'd expect for one single proton or one single neutron. So you get a more massive nuclei that if you hit that nuclei with the alpha particle, then the, um, that particle's deflected. So they saw what you might call wide angle deflection indicative of the nucleus being present within the gold atoms. So that led to the nuclear model. So Rutherford's gold foil experiment led to what you would call the, the modern atomic theory of protons, neutrons in the nuclei, electrons outside the nuclei. And that just leads to the whole idea, you can change electrons very easily on an atom, you can kick one off, you can add one in, make anions or cations, 
very easily. You're not exchanging protons or neutrons very easily. Okay, and so then we're you know, describing the periodic table, looking at symbols, looking at compounds, getting into ionic versus molecular compounds. Key there, ionic, metal, and nonmetal. So you get a left side element, not hydrogen, hydrogen's a gas. So a metal from the left side paired up with a nonmetal on the right, uh, make the ionic compound. And molecular would be the ones that are sharing electrons among nonmetallic elements. So we can classify ionic and molecular. Okay, I think I'm going to go a little bit faster through some of these. But so chapter two, we end up naming a lot of things. Um, there's a lot of, of uh, um, bullet points, but I think we're just like naming and identifying lots of different properties of ionic compounds and naming things like acids, naming things like binary molecular compounds, alkanes or simple hydrocarbons, and then the alcohols of those simple hydrocarbons. Chapter three, this is actually all the chapter three objectives, because chapter three, Without even looking at the objectives, you can probably say, well, it's balancing reactions. We had three key reactions, the combination, the um, decomposition, and the combustion reaction. So being able to write those reactions uh, for a couple of examples, the combustion is probably the key one for hydrocarbons forming CO2 and water and balancing those reactions. And then doing problems like converting grams to moles, uh, moles to molecules, molecules to atoms, and then doing problems where we identify formula from data, so percent masses to empirical formula, uh, combustion data to empirical formula, empirical formula, bless you. Uh, so empirical formula with um, molar masses into molecular formula. And then from there we were doing stoichiometry. So we were working out how much products form, how much reactants react, how much reactants remain, excess versus limiting reactant, and percent yields. Okay, so generally that's what I, I would try to do. So maybe spend 30 minutes on chapter one, reading those a little bit more thoroughly, clicking a few problems, reviewing some of the text if there's certain areas where you read an objective that you don't understand or something in the chapter summary that you don't understand. Okay, so let, let me talk about a few other things here today. Um, one of those is on metacognitive skills. So this is like a big buzzword in education. Um, where it's, um, what it means, it's an awareness of your understanding of your own thought processes. You know, so as you go through the course and as you go through any of your classes, if you can be in tune with what it is that you know today, with what it is you need to know tomorrow, you might be able to like fill in the gaps a little bit more easily. So it's just trying to understand how it is that you're trying to process information and trying to learn from what you know. Okay, so some of the key recommendations I have here for being able to try to use and almost like self-diagnose or self-assess the things you need to learn, um, something um, that a book calls us the power of the preview. So if you always preview the material, do your assignments before class, I think you'll be ready to pull more information out of lecture. Uh, I call it two steps forward, two steps back, which is you know sometimes you need to move forward in the book and then make sense of what came before it. So sometimes you need to keep that process of maybe section one won't make sense until you read section two, but section two won't make sense until you read section three. So you just kind of keep this like forward, backward motion as you're reviewing the content of a chapter. So if something doesn't make sense, and I do think we're gonna, like chapters four and five, and as we get along, are gonna get a little bit more convoluted in some of the information. So I think as we go along, the chapters get a little bit more difficult. You may have to employ the strategies of kind of moving forward and then reviewing something from the previous section and seeing if it makes more sense then. Uh, retrieval practice, this is the idea that the more chances you give yourself to retrieve information, the more likely you may remember the information. So if you, for example, look at um, chapter four, and you do all your chapter four assignments um, on a Sunday, and then you do all the homework problems in the book on that same day, you're not really giving yourself as many chances to retrieve information, kind of forget it, and then look it up again. And so if you do all your studying in one day, you're probably not going to gain as much from that time as if you had done that studying the same amount of time spread across like two weeks or a week and a half. So think about how it's really not about cramming a long study session. That's why I've created a lot of different homework sets um, not so that you're doing super busy work, but so you're giving yourself more chances to retrieve information and doing some shorter problem sets instead of like one or two long sets each week. And then lastly, self-assessing. I mean, that's like easier said than done, but if you can figure out what you don't know, then you can more easily figure out how to fill in those gaps. It's harder for me to tell you what to review. It's easier for you, I think, to, to gain the skills of trying to figure out what you don't know uh, through taking practice exams, through reading, um, um, the uh, chapter summaries, the learning uh, outcomes that you should be achieving, and then filling in from there. Okay, lastly, this is just um, something on you know, previewing, attending class, reviewing after class, studying, assessing. 
kind of there's this like you can almost wrap this around every subsection of the book or every section of the book how you can have these um, study cycles ongoing at multiple different cycles. So maybe you're reviewing, um, you know, the the chapter two as you're just beginning to preview chapter three. You know, so just think about how you're employing these cycles continuously throughout the class. So maybe on a given Thursday, uh, a couple weeks from now, you'll be um, sort of doing some homework problems on chapter five, but previewing chapter six and kind of keeping that going throughout the semester. There's this idea of Bloom's taxonomy of, you know, if you want to get to the point where you're doing exam level problems, or exam level problems are mostly application and analysis level in this class. If you're going to apply and solve and analyze your results of problems, it's really hard to do that if you don't understand a lot of basic information and basic uh, content. So you kind of have to start at the bottom. You have to start by you know, knowing your terms, knowing your definitions. So I think you have to remember your vocabulary or learn your vocabulary, understand how it ties together and ties to some major concepts and equations, and then apply those to solving problems and then begin to analyze their results. So you can't just jump into, like jumping into a practice exam when you're not ready, you're gonna start trying to analyze problems that you don't know the fundamental nature of the problems yet. And so you're gonna be kind of stuck. Like that's what happens. If you get over the weekend and you find half the test, you can't do it. We need to jump back, put the test on hold, uh, put your practice exam on hold, and just go review those chapter summaries and go do some more pre-reading um, and then come back to that exam and hopefully have it make more sense. If we try to take a problem we just don't understand at all, we're gonna try to just learn how to solve a problem we should be able to comprehend and use some simple ideas that we have in our minds to solve. So the the amount of knowledge I think we need for this upcoming midterm is really pretty small. I mean, I think it's really just the amount of uh, getting the right practice of applying that information so that we can see that we're not learning how to solve every problem. We're just trying to apply a solution that's very general to a variety of problems. Okay, now these are just some final um, additional strategies of things like previewing, uh, reviewing notes, making notes, maybe forming study groups. So there's some additional suggestions on here. Um, one of the big ones I think would be getting together if you haven't already with a few of your classmates to study for the test over the weekend might be a helpful way to, to help review the content. Okay. All right, so let's move past that and get on to um, some actual content here. So, um, so again, I emailed out, I think it was 17 or 18 questions. I just kind of randomly chose problems from the practice midterms. I tried to hit on some areas of, of things that maybe would be questions that kind of stand out as being strange that we could try to talk about what we're supposed to apply here. So let's look at this first one. Um, let me ask a generic question. How many of you guys have not looked at these practice exams? It's okay to, to say you haven't. Just I want to get a, a temperature. So it's just about a third. Um, like I said, there's seven practice tests um, on, on Carmen. These are just some random selections of some of those questions. Okay, so this one here. Of the different separation methods discussed in class, we discussed filtration, distillation, chromatography. I remember having a couple slides in here where we talked about those. So filtration is like solid liquid uh, filtering. Distillation, two liquids of different boiling point. Chromatography was the strange one. That was like the black ink running through a piece of paper where the ink separates into maybe the, the blue and purple colors. And you can see that um, whenever like ink gets wet and it destroys your, your paper. And so that's the idea of chromatography. So the different inks are just flowing through paper at different rates. That's why they separate. And so which of these rely on difference of physical properties of substances? Now, what this question is getting at is the idea of physical versus chemical reactions. So a physical reaction is just like a phase change or a separation. And then a chemical reaction is where you start changing one molecule into another or different elements into new types of compounds. So it's actually doing chemical reactions. And so if we were to write H2O liquid to solid. Is that a chemical reaction or a physical reaction? Physical. It's a physical. And now it looks like a chemical. I mean, we wrote it out like a chemical reaction. But a chemical reaction should have new molecules um, on either side of the reaction. So that, this would just be a physical reaction. OK, so the distillation, I don't like green. I don't know why I did that. Um, so the distillation, uh, filtration, chromatography, those would all be relying on just physical properties. So we're just separating a mixture. So we're just taking something that has two components and separating the two components. So no chemical reaction going on, just the physical uh, separation of two different compounds. So if you have a mixture of A and B, you end up with A here and B here. That's not a chemical reaction. I will pause after questions. So if you have a follow-up, feel free. That one's probably pretty easy. But if you have any follow-ups, just feel free to raise your hand. 
before we move on to the next question. Okay. So the next one, which pair of elements would you expect to exhibit the greatest similarity in their physical and chemical properties? Um, so we have sodium and magnesium. So, um, so that's like two elements in the same row as each other. We have hydrogen and lithium in the same column. We have silver and cadmium. So silver and cadmium, again, that's a left to right comparison. They're in the same, uh, row, uh, col uh, what was that? same row as each other. And then finally, helium and xenon. Helium and xenon are two double gases in the same column as each other. Now this problem is kind of strange, you know, because maybe we haven't thought of a question like this. But the periodic table is supposed to group elements by similar property in the columns. So now hydrogen and lithium are in the same column. Why would they not be the answer? Like, why would they not be similar in their chemical and physical properties? Yeah, hydrogen's a gas, so, and lithium's a solid. So, um, so we have to kind of compare the elements in the same vertical column that are the same phase uh, as each other would behave similarly in their physical properties. So like, if we look at the halogens, like fluorine and chlorine would be more similar than, say, bromine um, or, or, or iodine. So like fluorine is going to be more similar to chlorine than it would be to bromine or to iodine, just by basis of it being um, similar. Now, we could also look at um, um, non-metal being more similar than, say, non-metals compared to metals. So um, solid versus gas for hydrogen. We also have the fact hydrogen is a non-metal, lithium is a metal. So that, that also gives a pretty big difference. So like if we look at sulfur um, versus oxygen, probably fairly similar. But if we compare oxygen to like polonium, polonium is a metal. So we're going to get a big difference there. Or sulfur to polonium is going to be big as well. So it's not just solid to solid, but it's also like non-metal sulfur to like metallic polonium is going to be a much bigger difference in physical properties than, say, oxygen to sulfur. Even though one's a solid, one's um, a gas, they're going to be still more similar because they're, they're both non-metals. Now for this question here, helium, xenon, both gases, both in the same column as each other, they're far separated. But they're going to be most similar because they're both gases, both nonmetals. Um, so they're going to be more similar than, say, hydrogen and lithium. Follow-ups on that one. OK, so 22.5 uh, grams sample of ammonium carbonate. How many moles of ammonium cations does it contain? So our moles of NH4 plus. We take our 22.5 grams of ammonium carbonate, where there's two ammoniums and a carbonate. We need to work out the molar mass. I'm just going to call that the number of grams for now, and not really write it in. So one mole of ammonium carbonate contains two moles of NH4 plus. So that's the whole point of this problem, is you get two NH4 pluses per one of the moles of ammonium carbonate. So we convert to moles of ammonium carbonate, then moles of, of ammonium. So to go from the compound to the ion, we just use the formula. Go from grams of a compound to moles of the compound, of course, we're using the molar mass. Do we want to work this out? Do we want to move on? Move on, OK. And then if you haven't seen the problem, you want to take the test later, at least you won't just remember what the number is. So we'll just leave the numerical problems hanging. So that's the way we'd set up, just plug in the number of grams. OK. So number three, uh, th this one here, strange question in my mind. Um, so we have a 5.50 gram strip of metal, magnesium metal, being heated in a flame and a bright light is observed as a metal oxide is formed. What happens to the mass of the metal and why? There's a few things I really don't like with this question. Now, this is one of my colleagues' exams, so I shouldn't rip on too bad. But, um, but some of the things I find confusing on this question is just trying to keep straight what exactly it's trying to ask. Okay? So the metal strip, like we're imagining that it's reacting and something's happening on the surface of that metal. It's oxygen coming in. Now, the mass of the metal itself isn't changing. It's almost as if this problem is saying, what's happening to the mass of the metal strip, without saying that clearly enough. So if, if I were to edit this question, I wish it would say, what happened to the mass of the metal strip? Um, so you're trying to think of the entire strip of the metal, not just the individual metal atom itself. Because the metal atom itself, 
law of conservation of mass, it's not changing, right? If you have a, a magnesium atom, the mass of that atom should be constant. But the idea here is it's adding an oxide onto the surface of the metal. So you're adding oxygen onto the surface of the strip as you're forming that metal oxide. So it's like you had a strip of metal that had magnesium, then you have the reaction take place, and then you have the O attached to it. So now we've added to the mass of the strip by adding the oxygen. So we're going to be adding to the mass, we're going to increase the mass of the strip, um, not of the magnesium itself. It's not like the mass of a single atom of magnesium is changing here. It's like we're adding and making a compound on to the surface of the strip. So a strange question, somewhat hard to interpret, but this is one of the reasons why we go to a combined exam, right? So get five to 10 of the chemical attendance instructors in the same room, agree on the questions, try to revise questions so that we don't have reading issues like this when we look at test questions. So that's one of the old tests. I wanted to make sure we talked about that one. I'm sure if you saw this on the test, you would be very confused by that question. But so in terms of what's going on, we're just trying to think, from what's given in the problem, magnesium has oxygen being added onto it. Follow-ups on that one. All right, so we get a combustion problem. So a substance contains CHNO uh, when 0 0.09, uh, 105 milligrams of the samples analyzed by combustion analysis, we get so many milligrams of CO2 and so many milligrams of water. And so then, Notice the question isn't asking what maybe you expect. So normally you would expect it's going to ask what's the empirical formula or what's the molecular formula. Um, but the question is asking something different. It says how much oxygen um, was present in the initial sample expressed as a percent of the total mass. Okay. Now in writing that, the, the verbiage is somewhat complicated. It's just basically saying what's the percent O in the sample. The percent O in the sample, that's a very simple idea, right? It's just the the amount of um, oxygen, it's like the number of milligrams of oxygen in that sample divided by the total sample mass, which we already know, times 100%. So what we're looking for is the mass of, of oxygen in the compound. So that means we're going to have to work out the mass of carbon from the CO2 mass in the compound, the mass of hydrogen from water, subtract those off the sample so we can get the mass of oxygen. So I think a problem like this, when you see this on the test, like if you have the thought process of that little twist, like not asking for the formula that you've expected the problem to ask, and not immediately knowing how to handle what it really wants, that might make you say, I'm going to skip this question until the end of the test. Just to think of test taking strategy. If you don't know, if you're going to get caught up on a step in the problem that seems unfamiliar to you and you don't exactly know what to do and you know it's a long problem already, you may skip this one. But if you read this problem, you see, oh, okay, I know how to find the milligrams of oxygen. I'm going to find the number of milligrams of, um, of carbon, the number of milligrams of hydrogen, and I'm going to get the carbon from CO2. Uh, I don't know why this problem uses milligrams, but we could convert to grams. I'm going to leave it in milligrams, though, just to show this one step here, that when we're thinking of the milligrams of CO2 in a mole of CO2, like how many milligrams is that? Like it's 44.01 grams. What's 44.01 in milligrams? 44,000 milligrams per mole of CO2. So we could just do that. We could convert the molar mass to milligrams per mole. We could convert the milligrams to grams and then solve accordingly. But at some point, we're going to have to convert the mass of carbon and um, hydrogen back to milligrams anyways to be able to convert um, and subtract from the mass of the sample of milligrams. So one mole of CO2 contains a mole of carbon. What's the mass of carbon? 12.01 milligrams. So one mole of CO2 contains 12,010 milligrams of hydrogen. Now, I did that step like, kind of quickly, right? Like one mole of CO2, one mole of C, one mole of C, 12.01 grams, one gram, 1,000 milligrams. You could write out more steps if you need to. Like if combining some steps and combining some conversions doesn't make sense, write it out. You know? like, do whatever you need to do in the test. You take multiple choice tests. We don't collect, well, we collect your booklets, but we don't check your work. Um, so whatever you write down is up to you. So write down the steps you need to write down to understand how to solve a problem. So we're just going from milligrams of CO2 to moles of CO2, moles of CO2 to, and I wrote hydrogen, I should have wrote carbon. 
um, use the right mass, wrote the wrong. So this is milligrams of carbon. Okay, and so we do the same for hydrogen. The only difference there is one mole of water contains two moles of H. Two moles of H would be 2,016 milligrams, or 2.016 grams. Okay, so I think I'll hold off on five. Are there any questions on five that you have right now? Because the idea is you take your milligrams of carbon and um, number of milligrams of hydrogen, subtract those off from your total sample. So get your two masses of C, get the mass of H. Your compound contains CH and O, so just take this minus the milligrams of C minus the milligrams of H. That's your milligrams of O that you plug in and solve for the percentage. Okay, so this problem, just like the empirical formula problems, we're getting the, the mass of oxygen, but instead of taking the ratio of the masses of those elements into a ratio of their moles, then into a formula, we're just stopping short. This is actually a simpler problem. So if you think of the amount of number crunching you normally have to do on a percent mass problem, this is actually simplifying it, um, as long as we pick up that little variation and solve it for the percent O. Okay, so um, now question one, the one below this, is it's kind of a doozy in a way. Like this is what I would call um, like a problem, you know, you know, like something you can generally solve using a few ideas. You know, it's not exactly a problem. Like, if we let's read through it and see what it's asking. So, we have a compound contains a mole ratio of hydrogen to carbon of 1.67 and is 43.8% uh, oxygen by mass. What's the empirical formula? Now, at first glance, you're probably like, what? <laughs> like, wh like, that's not like a problem we've seen before. Like, we've never seen a problem worded in this way, I don't think, at any point in the class. But let's just try to take the information and see what we can make of it. You know, so can we solve the problem? So this is more like a word problem. I would say sometimes you get you know, one or two questions like this on a test where you get an un unexpected word problem where you just have to take the information and try to use it to solve the problem. Okay, we want an empirical formula. So we want the C to H to O ratio for the moles of carbon to hydrogen. Okay, from the mole ratio of C to H, that's already telling us this. So the C to H ratio is basically given to us already in the problem. It's 1.67. So we have um, more hydrogen than carbon. So 1.67 times as many H atoms in the formula as C. So we have C is like a ratio of 1 to 1.67 to question mark. We don't know anything about oxygen yet um, from just the mole ratio. So from this mole ratio, I got to get a whole number. For the formula, what I would need, so I think times two, times three, and times three works. 1.67 times three is five. One times three, of course, is three. So my formula should be C3H5 something, or some multiple like C6H10. So if I inspect my answers, I get C3H5, C3H5, and C3H5. So it's got to be A, B, or D. So C4H6 is the wrong mole ratio. That's four to six. That would be one and a half. So the ratio of H to C and, and, and C would be one and a half, not 1.67. Likewise, in E, it would be four to one, which is way off. So it can't be E. So I've narrowed in on three of the, uh, three of the answers. Now, multiple, cho uh, multiple choice tests are very interesting. You could sometimes solve problems a variety of ways. One way would be, what's the percent O here? You know what I mean? You could look at the A and say, well, what would the percent O in that compound be? And is it 43.8% by mass? You could look at B and say, is that one 43.8%? It turns out it is. Um, so the answer is B to this one. C would not be for it. It would be more than 43.8% by mass oxygen. OK, so like that's nice. You know, like if, if you can just look at the answers narrow in on a choice, and calculate and see which one has the right percent oxygen by mass. But now that's maybe not good enough. You know, like, how could we solve for it? Like, how could we use the percent oxygen by mass? Well, let's think of what we've done here. We know we have C3, H5, and then O with a question mark. And O could still be a fraction, we might, but not according to the choices. If we had to, like, hand write in an answer, it could be possible that it would be like C6, H10, O3, or something like that. Um, how would we figure this out? Well, we know the percent O. So the percent O, what does that mean? If you had a random compound, the percent oxygen, you would take it to be the number of oxygens in the formula times the atomic weight of oxygen, 60.00 AMU, 
divide by the molecular weight of the compound and have that equal the percent O. Percent O is 43.8%. Now, now, we don't know how many O's there are in the formula. Like, we know three choices, but again, we're trying to say, like, if you don't know the choices, you're trying to solve for the three, how to, or solve for the formula. Well, what if we go the percent CH? We know that percentage, right? You know, like, we could look at our compound and say, well, I know that, um, that I have to at least have three carbons and five hydrogens. And so that's going to have a mass, 3 times 12.01. plus 5 times 1.008 of 41.07. Divide by the molecular weight. I should really write the empirical weight instead of the molecular weight. So if I divide that by the empirical formula weight of whatever that happens to be, and then multiply by 100%, or just take it, keep it as a fraction and forget about the 100%, that that should be the remainder. Like, the compound is O and then C and H. So everything that's not O is C and H. So 1 minus, so 100% minus 43.8 is 56.2. The 56.2% of the mass of the compound is the C and the H mass. So what we can do is solve for the empirical formula. So we can solve for the empirical formula, because we know we got at least C3H5 in that empirical formula. And so divide 41.07 by 0.568 gives us a mass of 72.3 for the entire formula. And then all we need to do is subtract off the C and the H and then see how much the mass of oxygen is in the compound in that formula. So if I subtract off the C3 and the H5, the 41.07, that's 32-ish. Um, and then, um, actually, let me do the math. Oh, it's 562. That's why they didn't work out exactly right. So 438 Okay. I was wondering why it wasn't working out exactly. This should be 0.562. I just wrote the number down wrong. 41.07 divided by the right number comes out to 73.07. Subtract off the 41.07 leaves behind 32. So 32 AMU in the compound, 16 AMU per O means there's two oxygens. Okay, now tricky problem, but it's like just using what we know to help us solve the problem and thinking through just what formulas mean, what a mole ratio would mean. Maybe we've never seen the word mole ratio in this class, but it's just the ratio of moles, right? So it's just the ratio of moles of H to C. So we just use that information to help us solve the problem. Are there any follow-ups on this one? OK, this one here, interesting question 19. So if the filled spheres represent carbons and the open spheres represent oxygens, which one of these representations is a good depiction of CO2? OK, so and CO2 as a solid. OK, so now we might expect 2 to be CO2 as a gas. You know, like interdispersed particles, kind of randomly oriented. CO2 gas looks like 2. Now, what's wrong with 3? Why wouldn't 3 be what CO2 looks like? 3 is probably more akin to what something like titanium um, oxide would look like. Like if you had Ti plus, uh, 4 plus, O2 minuses, the ions get right on each other. So probably an ionic compound is what's represented by three. So if you see spheres in like direct contact, 
That's usually what an ionic compound would, would look like. So that would be more like an ionic uh, compound. CO2, of course, is a molecular compound. Molecular compounds like water, um, the water bonds are going to be closer together than the two adjacent water molecules. We talked about that in the coverage of the content of um, chapter one. Um, so in the case of CO2, we're going to have the, the CO2 atoms being close together and then a little bit further away from adjacent molecules. So it's going to look like one. And then four is just kind of nonsense. It's not the right ratio, so we don't get the right um, ratio of C's to O. So that would be uh, an empirical formula like CO, not CO2. So there's only one um, dark sphere to one light sphere. So that would not be right. So one is the most correct or the best depiction. Okay. My rule of thumb on the test is if you see a question that says, um, like, which field spheres represent, um, like, which representation depicts solid CO2? Like, it, like, think of giving the best answer. So whenever the, even though the question doesn't say, which is the best representation, think of, like, not getting caught up in nuance and always trying to give the best answer to a particular question and not trying to give, like, a finicky answer. Try to give a possible answer to a given problem. So this one here, Millikan oil drop experiment. Um, so what it did was, again, it took x-rays, um, fired them through like air and oil droplet, and then transferred electrons onto the oil droplet. So now it's saying, well, what if the opposite happened? What if basically the droplet was giving the electron to like an air particle? Now an air particle is probably going to be too light to be able to see, but what you can probably see through your, the same source that they were um, observing the charged oil droplet would be the charged cation. Okay, so instead of depicting electron or observing electrons, negative particles, on an oil droplet, they'd instead be observing a positive particle on the oil droplet. So what you would need to do is just flip and then have a positive plate to levitate that positive particle to be able to determine the mass to charge ratio. So you could get the experiment to work, but you would just need to switch the plates. So you just need to have, um, instead of a negative plate, you want this to be positive because we'd be creating cations, not cations, we'd be creating um, positive charged oil droplets that then could be repelled by a positively charged droplet uh, or a positively charged plate. What the experiment was really doing was creating negatively charged droplets which were repelled by the negative plate. Now some of these other choices, I don't know if it makes sense to read through them, like it would not work, no modifications necessary, that's just not the right answer. If it would not work because the mass of the oil droplet would change the mass of the electron is really light, so the oil droplet mass is not going to change. Based on whether it gains or loses an electron, the mass of the electron is very, very tiny. That's not going to lead to any changes. Um, it would work, but the um, charge and mass of the electron are constant. That just seems kind of like nonsense. And then it would not work because the oil droplets have different sizes. The size would be very similar if you gained or lost an electron. Let's just finish up with this one here. So we have a mass spectrum of N2. So remember, the idea of mass spectrometry, we briefly mentioned this, was how this is how we determine, like for chlorine, what the ratios were. So you put a charge on a molecule or on an atom, and then the molecule is like bent by a magnetic field. So you can very precisely count the different isotopes, come up with what are the atomic weights of the given isotopes of an element, and then what are their abundances. So it's a way of like observing different isotopes and then like getting the ratios right. So within this experiment, let's say N2 is taken to be 99.3% N14 and only 0.7% N15. What this is trying to get us to think about is how we could have a 14N bonded to a 14N in an N2 molecule. That's going to be most likely. We could also have a 15 nitrogen bonded to a 15 nitrogen. Um, that's going to be very rare, and then we could have a 14N to a 15N or a 15N bonded to a 14N. So these would have about 0.07% of a chance of being observed. This one here would be like 0.07 times 0.07. So it's, it's like we should be able to observe 28 mass units for this one, 30 for this one, and then 29 for these, and the 28 will be the most likely, because it's the most abundant isotope is 14. Um, the, the 29 should be next, because we have two possibilities, and there's about a 0.07% chance that either one of the ends would be um, um, that particular mass. And then a very unlikely case, but still possible that we have two 15 nitrogens bonded to each other. So having the most abundant, the next most, and then a very tiny possibility of having that 30. 
And so, um, and the key being we're seeing the mass of the whole molecule within this spectrum. So not just the single ends, but the N2 together. And so choice four is just wrong because it's showing the mass of 29 being more abundant than 28, which just doesn't make fundamental sense because nitrogen 15's abundance is very low. Okay. A few more problems that I'll record solutions to, get those posted. And then if you send me questions on other practice exam problems you would like me to make a video solution for, I'll do that as soon as I can. All right, guys, have a great weekend. Okay, so balance the following equation. What is the sum of the coefficients of the reactants and products? So we have aluminum, so that just means aluminum solid. Um, I'm not going to worry about states here, so let's actually just call it aluminum. So we have aluminum potassium perchlorate. So it should be K and perchlorate ClO4 minus. So that's KClO4 plus potassium Cl. No, chlorate's at minus one as well. Going to Al2O3. That's just right for a 3 plus and a 2 minus. And then KCl, potassium chloride. Okay, so let's see how we're going to have the balances here. So we have four oxygens and three oxygens. So we're going to need probably four aluminums and three KClO4s. So I kind of start with my tricky atom first. I notice I had three oxygens versus four. So going three and four on KClO4 and Al2O3, put the oxygens in the balance. And then three KCl, put the KCLs in the balance. And then we need eight aluminums. And then we're just summing this all up. So that's 11 plus 4 plus 3. So that should be 18. Okay, so for the next one, how many grams of ClF3 can be produced from 12.4 grams of chlorine and 14.0 grams of fluorine? Okay, molar masses are given for ClF and ClF3. Okay, in a way, these are kind of trying to trick us. And Pease me in a way that they do this in problems on some of our old tasks. They're giving you the molar mass of Cl and F, but you really need Cl2 and F2, so you're going to have to you know, turn this into Cl2 and this into F2. Um, so they're also not telling us to consider limiting versus excess reactant. This is just like a problem we did in class today. We want to know how many grams of product we can make. Probably the fastest way is to consume all the chlorine. We make as much ClF3 as we can, see how many grams we get, take the fluorine into ClF3, see how many grams we get from all of that, and see which one's less. So I'm going to calculate the number of grams of ClF3, consuming all the chlorine. Okay, so we start with the 12.4 grams. Now that's Cl2. So I use the molar mass of two chlorines. So that's going to be 71. 35.5, Okay, and then we do one mole of Cl2. So the reason why we need to use Cl2 here is because we're using Cl2 here from the reaction for one mole of Cl2 forms two moles of ClF3. One mole of ClF3 is 92.4 grams. Okay, so we do it again. And see which one of these is coming from our limiting reactant. 14 grams of F2. So that's 38.0 grams per mole of F2. One mole, not one mole, three moles of F2 combined to form one mole of ClF3, and then one mole of ClF3, 92.4 grams, the same as above. So if we stop and work these out, I'm going to hit pause and, and then write those in and pick up from there. Okay, so I get 32.3 grams of ClF3 from consuming all of the chlorine, and I had one mistake in my next step. It's two moles of ClF3 being produced off three moles of F2. So 14 grams divided by 38 times two moles of ClF3 divided by three, and then still multiplying by the 92.4 grams per mole gives 22.7 grams of product. So when we consume all the F2 and it's gone, now it's down to zero, we get this much product. 
we can, if we were to consume or be able to consume all the chlorine, we would get a little more product, but we can't get that much product because we max out at 22.7 because we're out of the fluorine. So we run out of fluorine when we hit 22.7 grams of product. So that would be our limiting, or um, that would be our yield for CLF3 for this problem. Okay, so this problem here is going to try to get us to remember the difference between precision or being precise versus being accurate. Precise is repeatable, not necessarily correct. Accurate means exact or true, close to the true value. And so if we're trying to figure out which student was the most accurate, I'm trying to find the one that averaged out as close to 14.5 centimeters as possible. So if we just quickly inspect, we got 14.47483 versus 65756 and 32898. Okay, so, um, so what we're gonna have to do is just take a simple average. And so if we just take a simple average, we're going to find which student is closer. So for accuracy, so it's going to be the closer to, closer on average to the true value. It looks like student two is the most precise. Most of those measurements were centered around each other. To know for sure, you would calculate the average deviation or the standard deviation and compare those deviations. But I mean, I think we can see that that student two's measurements are all very close together, and the other students are a little bit further away. So I think student one ends up just being closer on average to the right answer on this one. Okay, so this problem says in nature, magnesium consists of three isotopes. It means it exists as three isotopes. A sample of magnesium was measured using a mass spectrometer where the atoms were separated on the basis of mass to charge ratio. Select the mass that would be appropriate for magnesium. Okay, this is kind of a weird question because the, the thing we need to do is like look at magnesium on the periodic table and it's about 24.3 AMU. And then its isotope should have a pretty close mass to about 24, 25, or 26 and but not 24 and a half or 23 and a half you know, it's like each isotope of magnesium should have pretty close to a mass on about a whole number multiple of amus not exactly but somewhere in that ballpark so like one isotope of magnesium might have a mass close to 24 maybe another close to 25 another close to 26. now what makes two wrong is that the 25 would be the most abundant, so the average atomic weight of magnesium in two would be closer to 25 AMU. So that's not right. If we look at four, that's also going to average out at about an average atomic weight of 25. See, we need um, a distribution where we have mostly 24 to get the average atomic weight to come out to be about 24.3. So if it's 24 and the other two are a little bit heavier, then on average, Magnesium's mass is going to be a little bit higher than 24, about 24.3. So one makes the most sense. So three is wrong because it has fractions for the atomic masses, and that's just not right. And two and four are wrong because they would lead to average atomic weights of about 25 AMU, not close to 24.3. Okay, so we have a figure that shows some NH3 and O2 molecules in a closed container. Which representation would represent the reaction once it's finished. So we have um, four NH3s react with five O2s, and when that happens, we form four NOs and six waters. Okay, so um, we have what appears to be, um, let me think of my colors here. Let's do one NH3, there's two, three, and four. And so that's our four NH3s. Now we don't necessarily have five, we actually have more than five, let's switch to red, so our O2s, there's one, two, three, four, five. So when those react, then they're gone. And in their place would be our new molecules, we'll go green, 
So we would form four NOs. So we have NO six waters. And then the left over O2s. There's five. Now these would all be interdispersed. Okay, so uh, C and D are weird. They put some of the molecules at the bottom. I don't know why. That would make any sense. So that on that basis alone, in fact, D is missing the leftover uh, excess O2s. C has the leftover O2s, but one, two, three, four, and that's not quite right. So there's not enough oxygens and not sure why we have something at the bottom. It should all be interdispersed. So B, we have um, the right amount of products, but none of the leftover reactants. And then in A, we have, that'd be hard to count, but we have the uh, uh, trying to best way to count these. Okay, so the O has a weird shading. So this is an O2. That's an O2. That's an O2. And that's an O2. One, two, three, four, and this is an O2. So there's our five O2s that are left over. The NOs are these ones. So the solid N and one of those goofy O's. There should be four of them, and there are. And then lastly, waters, goofy O, Two hydrogens, goofy O, two hydrogens, goofy O, two hydrogens, same, same, same. And so that's one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's six H2O. And so that's what we should have. Four NOs, six waters, and then the five leftover oxygens. So the answer is A. Okay, so perform the indicated arithmetic and report to correct sig figs. So we do this step here, and we get 7.893 on the calculator good to the greater decimal place so it's 7.89 and then times doing the addition here and so that'll be 1359.2 and so that's only good to the ones placeholder ones versus tenths and hundredths or thousandths versus hundredths so then we multiply here we have three sig figs times four we should end up at three sig figs so that'll be b i don't even have to do the math because it's just varying two to four sig or two to five sig figs it should be three sig figs times four answer has three sig figs okay we have a naming question now this is interesting so the vo4 is not something that's in our nomenclature so we don't necessarily know how to name vo4 we don't know if that's supposed to be you know what it's supposed to be but we're told that um, calcium vanadate is CA3VO42. Now what that tells us, we know calcium is a 2 plus, so that tells us that the VO4 must be a 3 minus charged ion since it took three of the calciums, two of the um, vanadium um, ion, this oxyanion of vanadium. So when we have VO, VO4, 2, 3 calciums, that's telling us the charge work the charge out on VO4. So VO4 has a 3 minus charge, and we can infer that this is vanadate ion, and so then sodium vanadate would just have to be sodium with three of them. So Na3VO4 would be sodium vanadate. And our last question on this activity is which of the following best represents Li2S? The key here, plus two minus. This is an ionic compound. Two lithium ions, one sulfur. So now this might be what like water looks like, or H2O, something where you have two of one, one of the other, and the compound, but of a molecule. So this would be like a gaseous molecular compound. So that's not right. 
this here would be like a molecular compound that's a solid. So you'd have individual molecules that are attracted to each other where the molecules are further apart than the atoms are further apart in the compound. Uh, four is just kind of nonsense. It would be maybe what your ions would look like in water or something where you have your ions dispersed. So that doesn't make any sense. So by elimination, we're at two. The two makes sense because we're going to have basically a minus plus minus minus plus minus where these ions get as close together as they can. So if you look at a, an adjacent like unit, another adjacent unit that you have the, the ions as close together in the adjacent unit as they are to themselves within one given unit. Now what this means is that you don't really have a molecule in an ionic compound like you do within a molecular compound. So your ions get as close together as they can. There's no real molecule in an ionic compound, just repeating ions. Two best represents that. Okay, so that's all the problems from this activity. Like I said, email me more questions and I'll make another video just like this.